first up, we have our next speaker, which is Tanmay Gopal. He's the CEO and co-founder of Hasura, um, and his talk will be on, is a GraphQL BFF necessary in a server-side React world? Please welcome Tanmay. <laughs> Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to day two. Uh, glad to be opening the second day with uh, something that I think has been fairly top of mind for uh, a bunch of us uh, kind of thinking about the space, which is GraphQL, BFF, server-side React, what's happening, so much confusion, there's too much going on. Uh, we've barely settled on how to kind of figure out how to do GraphQL, and now React's going and changing everything. Uh, who are the people who are building these things even? Are they a part of the same company? Who, you know, whatever. So um, this, is, uh, this is kind of what we're going to try to unpack today. So uh, before I begin, uh, that's my face in case this isn't enough. Uh, but uh, I am Tanmay. You can find me on Twitter at Tanmay. Um, uh, we've been building Hasura with GraphQL for a while now, um, delivering uh, GraphQL as a service offering. Um, started off as an open source project, uh, we're about half of the Fortune uh, 100 has a footprint and the largest um, SaaS, uh, bank, healthcare, uh, social media company, the one that invented GraphQL, uh, all happen to be customers. Um, and so it's been, uh, it's been a great journey with GraphQL so far. Um, a lot of you who are familiar with, Graph, uh, with Hasura and uh, GraphQL uh, might think of us as Hasura, oh, we do this Postgres GraphQL thing. Uh, but stuff has moved on since then, and so definitely check us out at hasura.io/ddn. Lots of cool open source stuff that's happening there, um, specifically related to kind of um, supergraph and um, complex kind of execution stuff on the data side. Um, but let's dive into um, the problem, which is: is this reality of an app? speaking to an API, speaking to a data thing, is it going to change to this, right? Which is a, a server-side React component, um, React on the client, um, speaking to uh, the data layer, right? And, and, and I'm not gonna get into, is, is server-side React ready? Um, is React server-side components or um, uh, server actions are they ready, right? Can we do CSS and JS? Oh, we can't yet. Will we ever be able to do it? Maybe we'll be able to do it one day. Nope, not, not that. Assume that it's all ready, right? But is this gonna happen? Um, and so this is perhaps uh, my controversial take one, which is that we see a lot of examples uh, that do this, right? Where in your React code, you're able to kind of call um, the database directly, right? It's not from the client, but from the same code base, right? Um, and and my take on that is that that's a strict no for anything that's slightly real, um, for an application that's slightly real. So it, maybe you have an application where you have uh, greenfield data. Um, the, the data doesn't matter. Maybe the size of your dev team is uh, more, quite costs you more than the kind of annual revenue of the product itself. Maybe you're a famous YouTuber. But it doesn't, like when you can YOLO it, uh, then you can you can do whatever you want, right? Like what cho what choice you make doesn't really matter. Just do what makes you happy and gets you to show up at work every day, um, and and gets the job done as quickly as possible. But in kind of all in in, in most situations um, where the stakes are high, where the choices that we make will affect other developers, the there is a performance and security boundary that determines the speed at which different teams and different developers iterate. And the API boundary is essentially something that abstracts that, right? So people, the, the rate at which we iterate on um, the API and data side starts to diverge, uh, the kind of problems that we solve starts to diverge very quickly from the speed at which you wanna iterate on the product side um, and, uh, and, and, and the kind of concerns that we have to solve for there. This problem becomes more serious in um, an enterprise kind of architecture or um, for a lot of us with complex, with large number of teams, a large number of products or a large number of domains, right? And you get this kind of mess where you have uh, almost a four tier stack, right? You have this product layer and then you have the domain layer and then you have the data layer. Uh, now the thing that's closest to the product layer, that API layer is, is often the BFF, which is optimized for that particular product, right? And so let's kind of unpack 
that and see where that fits in, right? Um, so let's zoom into one particular product that we want to look at. Um, and so the first option is, do those API things go away with the React server thing? Well, no, because for the same reasons that we just talked about before. In that case, um, should we then uh, think about that BFF layer uh, written in whatever protocol, doesn't matter, uh, getting replaced by, uh, by React? Uh, and by server-side React stuff that we want to do, right? Can we start putting data integration logic? Can we start putting um, server-side logic that needs to kind of get information from different domain services? And can we start putting it on the server-ish piece of React? Um, and so, and so when we kind of tease that, let me let me then frame that in the context of: Should we do? Do we have a space? Do we have place for GraphQL here, or do we do we not? Right, and how do we want to how do we want to think about how do we want to think about this essential question? I think about it from two points of view. Um, the first is performance and the ability to kind of improve performance over time, um, and velocity for developers and dev teams, which is the ability to kind of iterate. Um, and so, two things stand out. The first, when we're thinking about performance and data fetching, it's all about the waterfalls. Uh, simple example: you have users that fetch posts, that fetch comments. Right. In this setup. Um, when you're doing, uh, when you're rendering this with React Server components, you'll have, you know, you'll render your user component, and so you'll fetch user data, then you'll fetch the post data, and then you'll fetch common data. Uh, the nice thing, though, is that you don't have to do this on the client. You're doing this on the server, so you can do all of this on the server, and then send this to the client directly. So you've kind of solved for that overfetching, underfetching problem that we had in the beginning. Um, we've also solved for that kind of, um, we've removed kind of, the, reduced the size of the JS bundle and the hydration step that is expensive, right? So that, that piece is getting solved well. Um, suppose we were to not, uh, suppose we were to use GraphQL um, instead of hitting the domain services directly, right? And so that would then be, you'd compose the different fragments that, uh, that the, the specific components have, the user component, the post component, and the thread component, and then you'd render these three, um, and then you'd send that to the client. Right, so you get to shoot one query, doing this, um, then render it, and then send it to the client. Right, and so we still have um, the React server component solving for the overfetching problem, the underfetching problem, uh, the JS bundle stuff, etc. Um, we have GraphQL taking care of this multiple hops to the server and query planning and optimization. And the question is, is this piece worth it or not? Um, and this, I think, boils down to uh, the need for having a if you don't have a good GraphQL client, you're not going to be able to even try to kind of get that benefit that GraphQL is, uh, is, is, is going to be able to give you, right? Um, I would say that at this layer, um, when we look at the kind of the type benefit of GraphQL, um, I'd say that's replaceable with other kinds of API protocols, right? So is GraphQL necessary there? I don't know, right? I, I feel like you, you could have um, that component speak to domain services that also speak any other type API, uh, not sure about GraphQL. So, so this question then is uh, uh, thinking about are the optimization problems that we have when we want to fetch that complex kind of simple query that can have complex fetches, um, are there enough problems to solve uh, that could make this interesting? Um, and I think as applications start to get complex, there, this definitely becomes quite challenging, right? Um, you move from just doing n plus one calls and being able to get away with it uh, to uh, starting to have a more complex kind of a, a negotiation with upstream services, asking them to create batch endpoints instead of just hitting those endpoints directly. Um, and the way that we're thinking about GraphQL execution is also starting to change. Uh, uh, the Graphite folks, Benji and co, uh, have been working on Graphast. Uh, at Hasura, we're working on uh, native data connectors. Things that will help um, improve the way we think about GraphQL execution in a significant way so that we can start to solve these problems. And this happens even if you have a single domain service or multiple domain services, right? Whether it's like one data, uh, one area of data or multiple areas of data. Um, and so the question that this boils down to uh, for me, and when I, when I, when I look at uh, applications and I speak to customers, is essentially what is going to set us up for success more? Is it going to be having a different component there or not? Um, to me, the answer is that it's probably still worth it to have uh, a GraphQL-like BFF layer. Um, 
a GraphQL-like layer that's doing data integration behind, whether you want to call it BSF or not, uh, server-side React component. The, the reason why I've colored those two white is because those are maintained by the front-end teams, and you have the blue stuff that is maintained by, quote-unquote, um, back-end teams. This architecture does set us up for success um, because there's enough and more problems that we gradually need to solve. Now, I'm not taking a point of view on how we build that GraphQL layer. Is it uh, maintained by a centralized team? Is it federated? Is it stitched? It's that, that's still um, things that we have to work through. But, um, but that piece, there's enough problems to solve um, that start to add up pretty quickly as soon um, as data fetching starts getting complicated. This is, by the way, also what we're seeing in the ecosystem. This was a recent conversation uh, that was happening on Twitter. Uh, the first response to this complex uh, fetch, uh, this kind of tweet that started with Tanner, was uh, GraphQL. Um, and so I think, I think gradually people are starting to kind of get to the place where uh, we're realizing that we still need uh, a, a fetching layer like GraphQL to sit behind uh, whether we use a server-side React or not. Um, so the second thing uh, is on the integration side, and when I think about API integration, um, we've seen over yesterday uh, exploring kind of different API protocols, looking at the trade-offs of GraphQL, whether um, types and API schemas are still valuable or not, right? Does, does GraphQL's type benefit, is it kind of replaceable now or is it not? Um, and so when I think about API discovery and onboarding, not kind of the API integration of it, which is just type specific, um, I think about these two things. On one side, with a GraphQL-like system, I have this, right, where I can see what is in my system. And on the other side, I see a list of stuff that I can do um, that has a lot of permutations and combinations, right? Maybe it's well-designed, maybe it's not, but there's a lot of different possibilities in the way I can do, in the way I can do things. Um, I, uh, and I'm guessing everybody kind of prefers this way of understanding the domain uh, and then figuring out how to access it versus that way of understanding the domain, right? So from just a speed of being able to understand what's happening in our system, this is better than this. Um, but technically, it's kind of independent of GraphQL, right? Because you can have a GraphQL-like system and then get a lot of free tooling out of the box um, or generic tooling out of the box, or maybe you have a great massive platform team and you build that tooling. Um, or you can still have all of those independent endpoints and document this kind of graph that exists in the system. Um, now, obviously, all of us who have been in software engineering for more than six months uh, uh, realize that nobody, nobody does this document and documentation thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like it just, it's just set up to fail, right, uh, from the very beginning. Um, it's just terrible. Um, so, so that kind of, again, then puts me in, when I think about setting up for success, um, the idea of having, of having generic tooling come out of the box is great. Um, but there is a call to action here for all of us as an ecosystem that I'll get to in a second. One of the things I've been thinking about lately is, can we decouple the supergraph from GraphQL on the wire? Can we, can we think about that a little bit separately? Is there a lot of value to gra uh, supergraph um, and the idea of having this composable um, set of entities that exist and being able to fetch them and understand them, but be a little bit different from GraphQL itself. Increasingly, I've been noticing, especially in large enterprises, that the value of having uh, a super graph is massive, especially as they start thinking about next generation of applications, they're building stuff with AI. Um, they need this idea uh, of being able to understand what, what is where, and that's very valuable, and that's getting pushed down one layer just below the front end. People start. People really like the idea of a self-serve API, which GraphQL has, but that doesn't have to be GraphQL itself. The delivery methods that people want are changing as well. Um, we've seen a lot of asks, for example, for subscriptions not being delivered over WebSockets, but being sent over Webhooks or Kafka, right? So you want, you want that ability to understand what events you have and how you can enrich them, but you don't necessarily want WebSockets because the consumption method is different, right? Um, this, and more specifically this, is where I think we're heading. Um, the idea of somehow creating a graph layer um, and allowing for a GraphQL API and maybe even other types of APIs uh, that we can provide to systems. But this kind of moves that moves GraphQL 
one level below a BFF um, and powering perhaps things that uh, a BFF type uh, technologies that need to exist slightly uh, more downstream in the stack. Um, I think server-side React is an opportunity for GraphQL. They go really well together. Uh, it's almost as if the same company made it. Um, and uh, I think it's a signal that front-end teams um, increasingly are going to start building applications in a way where their compute is spilling over to the edge. Uh, we have seen um, React server components be a great benefit for reducing uh, network and compute uh, by moving JS bundling, by doing heavy computation and moving that to the edge. Um, we're perhaps going to see the same thing for mobile applications as well, where we start to leverage the edge a lot more natively as an experience of building an Android app or an iOS app. Um, but for us as an ecosystem, I think we have, uh, we have to rapidly improve and evolve uh, the ecosystem. Um, on the GraphQL client side, um, we have to invest in better clients, taking ideas from Relay. Um, over, 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 the, over yesterday and today, um, we have um, Alec from GraphQL Houdini, we have uh, uh, Robert at um, Isograph, at, and taking these ideas um, and, and, and making our client ecosystem much, much better so that we can create these kind of more powerful applications uh, going forward. Um, we have to invest more in different ways of thinking about GraphQL execution, uh, like I talked about earlier, and then, of course, the different ways of building that kind of super graph layer. Um, we, we, um, Uri and Co. introduced uh, GraphQL Fusion yesterday, um, but we're, and, and, and there's a lot more work to do, um, and we need to keep exploring different, op different ways of thinking about how to build um, that graph layer. Um, I think also the way that we're thinking about GraphQL is changing. If you look at the overall mode of the ecosystem industry, we wanted GraphQL to be a quick win, uh, a tactical solution. We wanted it to move at the same pace that we want to move with Node and um, TypeScript and NPM and Yarn and Beat and Webpack and Yeoman and like, uh, you know, there's like, there's a lot, there's a lot, right? Um, that's happening and it's happening very quickly. And we wanted GraphQL to move at that speed, but it's not that, it's not, it's not tactical anymore. I think the thing that's happening is that we're realizing that it's, um, it's a strategic choice and if we, if you think about it properly, if you think about introducing it and scaling it properly, it can actually set the business and our teams up for a massive amount of success uh, going forward, but it needs to be thought through. We can't just chuck it in and hope that it works, um, and that, I think, is, is, is a part of the mood that we sense uh, with GraphQL and the overall uh, kind of ecosystem. Um, we're doubling down a lot on Relay. We're doubling down a lot on complex execution stuff, on uh, uh, interesting ways of thinking about federation, especially when it comes to Supergraph. Um, and so please uh, please do feel free to reach out to anybody at Hustler and to us to chat a little more about these things. Uh, and if you're, if you're thinking about these things as well, uh, would, love to, would love to chat with you. Um, that's me, and uh, I'll see you folks at the conference. Have a good day too, folks. <laughs>